I now to recognize uh, Dr. Sisley, who will provide us with an overview of evidence-based research on the efficacy of medical cannabis and her research with the use of medical cannabis in the treatment of chronic post-traumatic stress disorder in veterans. Uh, Dr. Sisley, uh, when you are ready, you're recognized to present before the subcommittee. Thank you, sir. Uh, Sue Sisley, I'm a physician from Scottsdale, Arizona. I, uh, I'm a principal investigator on a clinical trial looking at whole plant cannabis in uh, veterans with PTSD, but I'm also you know, a full-time practicing physician. I see patients full-time, and uh, I also, I think in my bio, it talks about the fact that I um, serve as an independent medical director to um, medical cannabis license holders in many different states, so I have a, a lot of, um, of insight into how medical cannabis laws are successfully implemented, what are the best practices, what are the pitfalls, and I'd be happy to address that as well um, at the end if you have those questions. Um, uh, my disclosures are that I, um, I've never used cannabis personally. I'm not part of the industry, meaning I don't own equity or interest in cannabis grows or dispensaries, any of that. And I don't write medical cannabis certifications. I don't write recommendations. I'm just focused on the science. I'm a researcher. Um, and I'm interested in collecting objective data on how cannabis um, either you know helps or harms patients. So um, the staff asked me to try to coalesce some of the data about um, what what is the current scientific literature that supports the existing qualifying conditions. So I tried to summarize it in one slide for you so that to make this really straightforward, they were looking for, you know, gold standard trials, meaning in the medical community we seek, you know, double blind or triple blind randomized controlled trials in order to, you know, assure ourselves that these trials have good credibility and aren't filled with a lot of human bias. And so these are the studies that we have um, that defend, you know, th these qualifying conditions here are the illnesses that actually have that gold standard of randomized controlled trials um, to, to support their uh, existence in these different medical cannabis laws. So you can see there um, probably the most robust area of research where we have true efficacy data is in the area of multiple sclerosis. But you can see all of those conditions there have, um, I can provide a, a compendium to you that has um, all the randomized control trials that support these. So, um, so I wanted to start off with that, um, but then I want to talk a little bit about other illnesses that, um, that have control trials but don't rise to the gold standard of true randomized control trials of, of high rigor. This is an example of a lecture I went to recently. Many of you know Nora Volkow. She's the director of NIDA, the National Institute on Drug Abuse. And she presented this lecture where she talked about, um, for the first time ever, I've heard her now describe cannabis or, and cannabinoids as a potential treatment for pain. I, you know, I've been examining the cannabis issue now for 10 years, and I never thought that I would hear the director of a federal agency like NIDA that focuses on doing safety studies. Um, that they would ever acknowledge that cannabis has efficacy in pain. But this was a formal lecture she presented, and I think it's a good start, a good sign for, um, for the potential to do efficacy trials and to remove some of the barriers to research, given that we have this head of a federal aid who's, who's you know, traditionally been highly skeptical about efficacy of cannabis. Um, we, I know that in the constitutional amendment that was passed, that you already have now, the, the voters have, have stated that they want PTSD added as a qualifying condition. Um, so on the first slide I showed you, you may have noticed that PTSD was not on, excuse me, was not on the list of, tri of medical diagnoses that actually have rigorous randomized control trials to support them. But I did want to give you one example of some of the observational studies that have been published, this one in particular, published in a legit peer-reviewed medical journal that I think is uh, robust and compelling enough to, 
to warrant um, looking at this. This was a study done by a physician. He followed 80 military veterans through their New Mexico state medical cannabis program. And he documented using the CAP scale, CAPS is the gold standard for measuring severity of PTSD. It's the same standard the FDA uses to add Zoloft and Paxil. Anyway, he documented a 75% reduction in PTSD severity in these military veterans, which is very difficult to achieve. I can tell you, as someone who tr has been treating military veterans for 20 years in my own practice, um, it, it's very rare that I can ever achieve 75% relief in these patients with traditional, you know, standard uh, medication. So I was really um, persuaded by tr this trial and other trials that have been published in peer-reviewed journals. No, they do not. This is not a randomized control trial, but it's still very impressive. Um, this is just, I, I know we have a dermatologist on the committee, but I did want to point out that the, you know, the, the discussion about the anti-cancer properties of cannabis is real. There are, you know, there is some robust preclinical and phase one trials now looking at uh, the anti-cancer properties at the receptor level. Um, this is an example of a case report that we submitted to the Journal of Dermatology where this was a patient who had a squamous cell cancer um, and her first line of treatment was a, a, a daily application of a high THC formulation um, where she applied it to the lesion every day for a full month. We did a repeat biopsy that was negative. I was, you know, uh, highly skeptical when we embarked on this because I thought there's no way this is going to work. And even the pathologist was surprised and did uh, two or three, uh, a second and third read on this just to make sure. We, but so I think this is the kind of thing that um, that we need physicians and other medical professionals to make a commitment to publish these case reports because no, they're not randomized controlled trials, but these case reports set up an argument for why we need controlled trials and if we can persuade physicians to make the commitment to start documenting this data, um, it is going to be helpful down the road. Um, this is an example, and I know Dr. Mondras alluded to um, the studies that have come out of the Cannabis Institute in California. Um, this is one example of a HIV uh, neuropathy study that Dr. Abrams did. Don Abrams is one of the seminal researchers in this country who did a lot of the initial efficacy trials. But I, I bring up this study because I think it's so emblematic of the problem that we've had conducting efficacy trials in this country where you can see that the study forced patients to take their this cannabis study drug from the federal government to take it three times a day. So that's what it traditionally all efficacy studies have forced patients into what we call fixed dosing models. So in this case, they had to take the, the medicine three times a day, whether they needed it or wanted it. And in this case, you can see it's I know it's hard to read, but you can see the comparison in the side effects with patients who are on study drug versus placebo. And you can see that there was considerably more dizziness, uh, sedation, things like that with patients who are on cannabis because they were forced into this fixed dosing model. And that is something that we have been able to now change. Just recently, um, the FDA approved our protocol for the first time with a, with a patient self-titration model. And I think that's the beauty of these um, these programs in these different states, it, it's a it's a um, how do you say uh, you know it's a balancing act because yes we want to pay, empower patients to take what they need and then to stop um, certainly that can be abused but um, overall cannabis being that it's a botanical medicine we have to allow patients to um, to take what they need to target the symptoms that they're trying to treat and then to stop. And I think uh, that's been the problem with these, that's why so many of these efficacy trials, as Dr. Maders pointed out, many of them have not demonstrated e efficacy because we're forcing pe patients to take far more than they need often. Uh, many times patients will just dose medicine at night. You know, if, they have, if they're a pain patient, they'll often just vaporize some cannabis in the evening prior to sleep to help sedate them. And that covers them throughout the next day. Often they don't need dosing two, three, four times a day. Um, this is an example. Any of you can go on cl clinicaltrials.gov, which is our 
national database that shows what kind of research is happening on cannabis. I will tell you that this is um, really, this looks encouraging that we have, you know, over 500 trials being conducted in, in different stages of maturity, um, looking at cannabis. Uh, the problem is that I will submit to you that that the bulk of these studies are all safety studies, right? They're funded by the federal government looking at harmful side effects of cannabis and addiction potential of cannabis. There are very few efficacy trials that have been allowed to slip through the system and, um, and be implemented. So this is uh, deceptive. Um, the, the point 